so the key component is you know if you can set up all these business relationships to be fair and equitable right from the start then you don't have to worry about uh, making special allowances in your state plan and again those those special allowances are generally what causes all the uh, the conflict in the family so the advantages of a fair and equitable plan would be that you're you've got the family harmony your your kids are going to be speaking with each other you know 20 years down the road uh, the other advantage is you're spreading your taxable income out over more individuals which would be in a lower tax bracket I still run into people that you know dad doesn't want to release any of the of the control of the operation and that he's, and he's also not releasing any of the financial control but that means he's the one reporting all the income because he's <coughs> he's uh, you know not they don't have a partnership agreement that's allocating half the profits over to the over to the son, and so if you're if you're going ahead and doing that, you might be actually able to save income taxes because you're spreading the income out over two families or three families, whatever the situation might be. And then the the big item is just you're creating that financial incentive for the for the on farm heirs. A lot of times you. You know, if, if son comes back and he all he sees is, well, all I'm doing is is increasing dad's net worth. It's going to be divided up among all of my siblings. Well, there's no reason for me to bust my butt uh, working on the farm when I know I'm not going to get my fair share of it. So you you create that incentive if you've got a good plan in place. And then you you also you know would reduce estate tax if the exemption would be reduced in the future. As Roger said this morning, with that that 5.43 million dollars times two, there's probably not a lot of uh, farm situations where there's going to be a state tax, but if they did happen to reduce that back down again, if you're letting the, you know, if you're letting the son build up net worth as, as he goes, instead of waiting to, to inherit that, then it just keeps the assets out of the dad's, dad and mom's uh, taxable estate and, and divides that out a little more equitably. So essentials of the plan is you've got to really fairly compensate the contribution of all parties uh, to the operation. It's got to be in writing. You really need to get it reviewed by your attorney and accountant. Those, that's really the key thing. You want to make sure that you've got uh, everything, everything reviewed. And then you also want to make sure that it's interfacing properly with the estate plan of the, of the older generation in particular. So you want to you know, be sure you get all these, all these done. So I've identified at least five of the things that I was looking at that I see most people contributing. You could probably add some other things in here, but that labor, of course, is the logical thing. You know, each, you want to decide what what is each party to the agreement contributing, and this could be something that might be variable over time. You might start out and it's and it's 50-50 uh, between dad and and son, uh, but as maybe dad turns 65 and decides he wants to semi-retire or retire, well, that's a way you can, you know, maybe you, you need to back off on that labor uh, compensation for the dad, and, uh, and and so it can be volatile over the years, or it might be, uh, you know, there would be all sorts of different arrangements you could do on that. Management, again, it's it, that would be pretty similar with, with labor, although, you know, you might have situations where dad may not be physically able to do labor, but he can still be an active manager, and so you want to figure out a way to to compensate all parties for for labor and management. Then the other thing is 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 that capital, uh, as I mentioned before in my example in Oklahoma, if one party is contributing uh, is contributing capital, you want to make sure that there's a that they're getting adequately compensated for that. So an example might be as if if uh, if dad and son start a partnership and dad has a million dollars of farm equipment that he's contributing in, you may have to say, well, dad's going to take a, a 3% or a 4% uh, guaranteed payment off that million dollars, so he may take the first thirty dollars or $40,000 of, of the net income, and then anything above that is split 50-50. Uh, so there's ways you can do that where, you know, in most situations, the, the incoming generation can't really contribute that million dollars to be able to be an equal partner in terms of capital, but if you can figure out a way to, to compensate the older generation for that capital, then it makes it equitable for everybody. The land base, that's certainly a fairly easy one for most people to, to logically consider. That would be if, if, you're, if you're using one party's land, you need to be sure and compensate them for that, whether it's a, a crop share lease or whether it's a cash rental lease, you want to be sure that you're 
adequately paying that. Uh, goodwill is kind of a, an interesting concept that, uh, let's see, I don't know if I have a, a slide here. Uh, goodwill is basically the, I was trying to think of a good example, the, the uh, over out, out in, in my area around Winfield and Ark City, uh, Dillon stores have a contract with a, an outfit that's out somewhere west of Hutchinson that's called uh, DeVore Farms and they sell melons and cantaloupes and watermelons and they evidently have, I don't know the people, but they have just a huge uh, watermelon and, and operation. Well, in a way that Goodwill is, is, the, is the value of just the advertising that those people have done and their, and the, uh, their ability, they may have contracts with Dillon's like the DeVore family obviously does, so that it's kind of an inherent value of things that most farmers don't, <laughs> don't deal with. But in my opinion, if uh, if Brian has you know if Brian has a three thousand acre farming operation and he gets ready to retire, I think most farmers don't realize that that there may be more value to that farm than just the than just lining up the equipment and selling it at an auction and and, and having all your neighbors fight over who's going to rent the ground. There's a you know goodwill would be like the inherent value that if if you're able to keep an operation together, it's worth a lot more than if you divide it up into pieces. And so. I know that uh, I know I've argued with some people even at K-State that say, well, really farmers, you know, right now don't have any goodwill. But I think as farm size gets bigger, is you know, as a, an example might be another good example would be if uh, again, if somebody's farming 5,000 acres and gets ready to retire, there may be there may be some other big farm that says, well, hey, I want to I want to come in and just buy your your business out instead of seeing it split up into into 20 different pieces and they might be able might be willing to give you a premium for for like your relationships with landlords that you develop over the years they may want you to stay on as a manager for a year or two to facilitate transitioning uh, land leases over and so that's an, another example of goodwill but most of the time we we really don't put a you know in a partnership or a or some type of an arrangement on transitioning over. We generally don't put any value on that goodwill, but it's really worth a lot in my opinion. <coughs> so labor management's a pretty easy concept to follow. You want to pay a fair salary, uh, you know, if that's a, a corporate or, or a sole proprietor. Uh, you want to set up guaranteed payments for labor and management if it's a general partnership or an LLC. And then you want to establish a way to get profit shared on a management <coughs> contribution not on equity contribution. Again, a lot of times the son doesn't have enough enough capital to, to be a 50-50 capital partner, but you wanna figure out a way to get it to where you're splitting profits off of management and not off of, of equity. The other point I'd like to make here is that um, the other frustrating thing I see is a lot of times that uh, I can think of a situation where son came into the operation, dad says, well, well we're gonna set up these guaranteed payments, and he says, well, well, you can uh, well you can live on three thousand dollars a month, and so so he wanted to set up three thousand dollars a month as a guaranteed payment. But I'm sorry to say that the, the days of being able to live on thirty six thousand a year are are way long gone, and the, and the easiest way to get in the doghouse with your new daughter in law or or the family is to try to you know is to force her to try to live on three thousand dollars a month in in labor. So I think you know you really have to be realistic. Our our uh, Kansas Farm Management family living numbers for for 13, which the 14 numbers are now, were, were approximately like 60, 62 or three thousand dollars is what the average family is taking to live, and uh, and a lot of times the people that are doing that keeping their detailed family living records are probably the the stingiest uh, penny pinchers of, of anybody, and so I guess that's one key thing I try to point out to you is just be sure that those are realistic salaries because you you know the quickest way to get in trouble is to you know is to try to think well you can you know that your your son and daughter-in-law can live on three thousand dollars a month it's just not going to happen in my opinion and if they can do that that's great and but if you can at least set them you know, if you can set them up at a reasonable salary and they can see well you know whatever if they if they can live for less than that they can save that extra money but that's just that's just kent's two cents on that too <coughs> so on capital and land the you just want to pay a reasonable rate of return on those who contribute the capital. So again, that would be a situation that you know, equipment is probably the best example is is try to set a you know a, 
a three to five percent rate of return on equity and just be sure that you're making that guaranteed payment and then pay a cash rate or crop share on the land that's being used by the by the entity. Here is another example of my goodwill. I probably have hit this hard enough, so I'm going to skip over this. Uh, but it, goodwill is generally ignored, so this would just be a bonus to the on-farm area generally when you're valuing things. And then I made the comment, as farms get larger, I think the goodwill is going to become more marketable. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing I kind of threw this in is, is the, uh, I don't think Roger this morning talked really much about the step up in basis, but the, the key point is you're, is you're setting up these arrangements is, is uh, probably the biggest benefit that the, the IRS gives to people is when property passes through an estate, it gets what we call a step up in basis to the fair market value at the date of death. So, it, so if you've got a, if you own 200 cows that are worth $2,000 right now, and maybe they're all raised, so your, your tax basis then, because they're being raised is zero, well, if, if dad dies own, owning those 200 cows and they're worth uh, you know, $400,000, well then, your from income tax standpoint, the whoever receives those cows through the through the estate or trust is going to get a step up in basis to the four hundred thousand. So if mom's the one receiving it and she sells them, there'd be zero gain. If if son receives them, then he's going to be able to redepreciate those cows based off that four hundred thousand. And so with a lot of you in this room probably sitting with you know a million and a half of equipment, farm equipment is another big example of that. You've you've all taken bonus depreciation and quick depreciation on, on equipment as you bought it. If you've got a million and a half dollars of equipment, it goes through your, your estate, it gets that step up, up to the million and a half dollars. And so that your, your heirs would be able to re-depreciate that then again. So it's just a fabulous income tax benefit that there's still a lot of people that don't realize that. And so you want to be sure that you're setting up your structure in a way to, to be able to take advantage of that. So. Uh, this is kind of a complex uh, area, but you want to be sure that you're, uh, you know, you're taking advantage of that. And then, of course, the other, the other big low basis item is land. So again, land qualifies for that too. So if you had bought, if you had bought land for, you know, three hundred dollars an acre back in 1965, and it's worth twenty five hundred dollars now, well, then you get a step up in basis to that fair market value at date of death. So it's a, a really good benefit that a lot of times people. You know, don't realize that, and and I know the like Farm Bureau and the farm uh, organizations really fought hard because part of the proposals when they when we went to this higher estate tax exemption was there was talk about uh, you know if, if they did go higher they were going to lose the the step up in basis, and so it, that would really affect more of the rank and file farmers because it was you know a lot of farmers if you're a million or two the increase in the estate tax exemption wasn't really going to help you it was going to kill you if you didn't if you lost that step up in basis so in this whole political process you know that's something we have to continue to watch because i know that's one of the things with roger threw up a, a few examples of some of the obama proposals and that's one of, that's another one they're looking at is is trying to do away with that step up in basis or or limit it to a certain dollar amount and uh, so we want to really continue to follow that real closely. So, uh, so land, livestock, grain, that's, that's another example would be if you, if, you, if you happen to pass away with a lot of grain in storage, that grain gets a step up in basis. And, uh, and then also growing crops in certain situations can get a step up in basis. So the, the reason I mentioned this is that uh, assets held inside corporations do not get a step up in basis. So you have to really be careful. You know, that's what we call the inside basis. Uh, you get a step up in the basis of the stock that you, you own as an individual, but if the corporation is liquidated, there's still, whatever the assets are sold inside that corporation still have to have the tax paid on it. So this is a trade-off you have to really watch closely is, do you really wanna to go to a, a C corporation or a sub S corporation because of you do not get that step up in basis, and that's one of the other reasons why that, as Roger mentioned this morning, that you know that kind of the entity of choice, especially for land, is more of an LLC that's taxed as a partnership because you can a partnership would get the step up in basis. So you want to really be cognizant of that because agriculture, 
is just a, is an industry that really takes advantage of this step up in basis because you have so much, you know, so many raised items, whether it be livestock or, and then so much uh, equipment that may have been depreciated out. So be really careful on that. So you want to always try to hold assets with a low tax basis in a, in general partnerships or LLC taxes partnership, if you can. <coughs> <laughs> the other thing as a result of that is that if you're if you're putting a value on corporations for like a buyout or arrangement for your your kids coming into the operation be sure that you're you recognize that there's a deferred income tax liability that uh, you want to you want to uh, factor that in so if you've got a million dollar corporation well if, by the time you you liquidate and pay the tax on it that corporation may only be worth uh, six hundred and fifty thousand dollars so if you're you know, if, if you're uh, if you're a 30 year old son coming back into the operation and, and are interested in buying into the corporation, you don't want to. Your dad has already had the tax benefit already taken on all that equipment and and all that, so you don't want to have to pay full value for that. When if you you know if if you bought in and then immediately turned around to liquidate it, you you would end up having a huge amount of income tax liability on that. So you just really have to be careful on on making sure that you're valuing the you know, put on your balance sheet of that corporation needs to show that that deferred income tax liability. And so what that's saying is by deferred income tax, it means that down the road at some point in time, there's going to have to be tax paid on it in order to get cash out of that corporation. So uh, it's a unique thing that you have to really factor into the valuations. The thing I think Roger was making the point this morning too is in, in the concepts I like to use is you always want to make sure if you can if you can if you can keep the business as separated between the operating assets and then the and then the real estate it just will it just makes it a lot easier to do planning for how do you treat the the on farm errors and the off farm errors fairly and again it may not be equally but fairly if you can keep uh, if you can keep those separate it makes it a lot easier because you can leave the you can transfer the value of the operating assets, which would be the farm equipment, the you know the cattle, livestock, etc., to the on-farm heirs, and then leave the the real estate to the to the non-farm heirs. And you can can keep control either through a long-term lease or through a uh, maintaining it with a buy-sell arrangement or or an LLC agreement. So uh, so that's an example, and uh, and then you're leaving management control of any entity you establish should be left in the hands of the on-farm heirs. And you can do that with, uh, say like in an LLC, uh, which is a lot of people are using now, you can set up a, a managing unit, which would mean has more or less, you can view it as like a voting rights. The managing units decide, you know, what's gonna, you know, what land is gonna be leased. If, is there land gonna be sold? You're deciding on that. Uh, and so you can leave the managing units to the on-farm heirs and then leave kind of non-managing non units to the, to the off-farm heirs. But yet from, a, uh, from an overall, you know, the rules are still such that you're, if you ever make a distribution out of that LLC, you've got to treat all, all the unit holders the same. So uh, you can't, you know, the managing member can't say, well, I'm gonna take a, a a thousand dollar unit payment and not and not give that to the non-managing members so yeah did you have a question okay 